Aloha, everyone. We'll get started now. I'd like to start off by welcoming all of our friends and alumni. And thank you for attending the inaugural College of Natural Sciences webinar. My name is Allison Sherwood. I'm the Interim Associate Dean for the College of Natural Sciences. And I'd like to start off with just a few reminders. Um, first of all, we recommend that you select the speaker view during this presentation to be able to best see our speakers. Uh, we also ask that you turn off your microphones during the talk, and you may turn it back on during the question and answer session that we're going to have right after the talk. Lastly, you are welcome to send questions into the chat box during the talk. These will all be saved and they'll be passed on to the speaker by me during the question and answer period. Um, and you also might be able to um, unmute your microphone during that time and ask your own questions during that question and answer period. And so now I'd like to introduce the Dean of the College of Natural Sciences, Dr. Luke Helmink. Aloha, welcome alumni and friends. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the very first College of Natural Sciences webinar series entitled Pilina Aro, what means living links. My name is Luke Helmink. I'm the Dean of the College of Natural Sciences, which is one of the largest colleges on the Manoa campus. The college is home to more than 115 faculty. Uh, we have many extraordinary teachers and researchers. We have more than 2,500 majors uh, spread out over six academic uh, and research units. The college is fundamental uh, in the STEM education for the state of Hawaii. We have strengths in many STEM fields, ranging from environmental conservation and sustainability, marine sciences, biology, botany, and microbiology, all in the School of Life Sciences, but also astronomy and physics, chemistry, and the quantitative and computational sciences like mathematics, computer science, information sciences, and more. In this series, you will meet and hear some of our world-renowned faculty, and they will tell you about their work and how it impacts Hawaii and the world. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our inaugural speaker, Dr. Mark Rickson. Mark is a professor in the School of Life Sciences within the College of Natural Sciences. He is the Sydney and Erika Tsao uh, endowed chair of marine biology and serves as chair of the zoology graduate program. His expertise is marine ecology and conservation biology, especially regarding coral reefs, which he has studied from all around the world. He began his studies of coral reefs in the late 1970s, year at UH, as a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow. Mark is a Fulbright Senior Scholar, an Aldo Leopold Fellow, and a Fellow of the International Coral Reef Society. Mark serves on uh, editorial board of multiple scientific journals. Mark is also the past chair of both the Marine Protected Areas Federal Advisory Committee for the National Oceanic and Atmosphere Atmospheric Administration and the uh, Ocean Sciences Advisory Committee for the National Science Foundation, both very high honors. M Mark has won various teaching uh, awards. You might also have seen him on one of the TED Talks or his appearance on the PBS TV show, Saving the Oceans. This year, he was recognized as the Scientist of the Year by the ARCS Foundation for his remarkable record of research and publication in the area of marine ecology and conservation biology as a mentor of graduate students and for efforts to educate the public about threats to our coral reefs. Mark has been recognized as the most cited scientific author on coral reef ecology in the United States. Please welcome Dr. Mark Hickson. Thank you so much, Luke, for that nice introduction. Um, it's, it's a great honor to be the inaugural speaker today, and I very much appreciate the invitation. And Aloha to all of you who have shown up. Um, I'm very grateful for your attendance and especially your interest in our mother ocean, which um, has been my great love most of my life. So let's go into the slides.
So a couple of a week or so ago, the um, first Hawaiian navigator of the Hokulea voyaging canoe that made its maiden voyage back in the 70s, Nainoa Thompson, gave the uh, commencement address here at UH Manoa. And Nainoa reported that we live in a time of storms. And I believe that's an excellent analogy for where we are in our relationship with the ocean. There are many storms brewing, as you can see in the clouds on this beautiful dawn photo of Hanama Bay. And the question will be, are we able to steer clear of those storms or at least endure them and come out the other side to fair weather? Now, I've spent decades giving talks to people and my favorite thing to do is always just to show really cool sea life and just the amazing beauty and fantastic variety of life in, in the oceans. But through time, it's become clear that just talking about that isn't enough. Knowledge is power, and we need to understand the threats to our ocean and explore the solutions. So the three parts of this talk will be bounty, threats, and solutions regarding Hawaii's changing ocean. But I first want to take a step back. I do this with elementary school kids, and I want to do this with you. And that is, I want to share with you a couple, before we get started, a couple of my very favorite ocean fishes, because these things are just so delightful and never fail to bring a smile to my face. So this is a frogfish. We have several species here in Hawaii. We even have this species, but it's quite rare. It's about four inches long, and it looks like a little chunk of coral on the reef. In fact, it's virtually invisible on the reef. They're very hard to see. But like all frogfishes, it has an appendage coming out of its dorsal fin with a little flap of skin on the end of it. Now, in most frogfish, these look like either a shrimp or maybe a worm, and they wiggle these things in front of their face, and a small predator comes up to investigate, and the frogfish has one of the most rapid strikes known in, in nature and quickly gobbles up that small fish. But if you look closely at the lure on this particular frogfish, which was discovered in the Philippines, the lure looks like a little fish. It has an eye, it has a dorsal fin and an anal fin and a caudal fin, like most fish do. And it wiggles this little lure like a little swimming fish in front of its face. So think about it a second. On this planet in which we live, there's a fish that fishes for other fish using a fishing lure that's a fish. That just never fails to blow my mind. Even weirder is this guy. Now, this is not a photoshopped photograph. I'm actually not using any videos today because I've found they don't work very well on Zoom. But you have to trust me that this is a bona fide, genuine photograph of this particular fish, which is called a barrel eye. This was photographed in Monterey Canyon off California. It exists throughout the North Pacific in very deep water, perhaps off our islands. We haven't been to seen it yet. But what looks like a transparent head on this fish is actually transparent. It's about a six inch long black fish with a completely transparent skull and head. And those green blobs you see, those orbs, are the eyes of the fish that are looking straight upward through the roof of the head so that the fish can swim horizontally and look straight up while it does. Now, why would it do that? Well, at this deep depth, the only real light that is available is the light that comes down from above, shimmering from the surface. And it enables this fish and any fish that looks up to silhouette its prey against that down-filtered light. So instead of this fish having to swim along and occasionally looking upward like most fish would, this thing can just cruise along horizontally with its eyeballs looking straight up. Then when it sees prey, and it actually what it does is it steals prey from jellyfish, is 
the eyeballs literally roll forward and you can see the two lenses there on the front. And um, it then has these viewing ports for consuming its prey. Again, really weird. The truth is much weirder than science fiction. Okay, so much for the fun show and tell. I'll show a few other cool things. Now, the reason I want to look at the threats as well as the solutions to those threats is the keiki, the children. I'm now a grandfather, and selfishly, I'm very concerned about the ocean that my grandchildren will inherit. So I'm doing everything I can to spread the word about what's happening in our oceans and what must be done. Now, when we talk about Hawaii's ocean, it's a huge, incredibly vast area. Federal waters go out 200 nautical miles. But today I'm going to focus just on our coasts where most of us interact with the ocean. Most of us visit the ocean. Most of the fishing takes place. And looking at a map, you can see these little red lines circled around each island, which of course are all jumbled up here in this, this map, showing the three nautical mile limit. This is the ocean that is under state jurisdiction. That is, we in Hawaii, through our legislature and our policymaking process, have control of what happens within these three nautical miles. And frankly, we haven't been doing a very good job so far as we'll see. So with that introduction, let's take a brief look at the bounty of our ocean here in Hawaii. The amazing diversity of organisms and the wonderful goods and services they provide for us for free. So that diversity is immense. That is the variety of life in our oceans. And it never fails to astonish people with its beauty and bring a feeling of awe, connection, and even deep spirit or mana. This is a shot from Papahanao Mokuakea, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, showing what a healthy reef looks like. Many different fish, many variety of fish, and a variety of corals. It's usually the fish and the corals that are the first things people notice on reefs. And we've got lots and lots of species here. And if we look even closer, we see that many of the species in Hawaii are found only in Hawaii on our reefs. About 25% of the species that have been found so far occur nowhere else in the world, here in the most isolated archipelago of islands on this planet. And in fact, if we go to some parts of our archipelago, this again is up at Papahanao Mokuakea, and go down in the deep water, this is down over, oh, about 300 feet deep, plus a shot taken by Richard Pyle, who works here at the Bishop Museum. Every single fish in this photograph is an endemic species. That is, none of these fish are found anywhere else in the world except Hawaii. So we have our very own treasure trove of species here. And it's not just the fish and the corals. There's a huge variety of organisms that live on our reefs. Now, this is actually a composite photograph that was taken in French Polynesia, which to have reefs quite similar to ours. And this is one cubic foot of a reef that was monitored by the photographer, David Lichwager, for a day and all the things that he counted during that one day. You see, it's not just fish, it's a huge variety of animals without backbones, worms and crabs and various things, as well as seaweeds and what have you. So think of the coral reef truly as the tropical rainforest of warm waters. There are so many species, it's just indescribable. In fact, worldwide coral reefs account for less than 1% of the oceans in terms of area covered and account for about a quarter of all species found in the ocean. This is a rich treasure trove we've been given by nature. And they live in this amazing interconnected web 
of interactions. Here's some surgeon fish cleaning algae off a sea turtle. And I should mention that sea turtles are one of the success stories of Hawaii. When I lived here 40 years ago, I never saw Honu while diving. And now I see them on almost every dive because people have stopped eating and harassing them and eating their eggs here in Hawaii. The Honu have returned. Okay, what about this treasure trove? What does it do for us besides being amazing in and of itself? Well, it obviously feeds us. Fishing is very popular in Hawaii. Seafood is very popular. And our reefs provide a huge variety of, of species that we eat. From the manini shown here, which are actually eating the small juveniles like little potato chips, all the way up to the giant ulua jacks that prowl our reefs that haven't been severely overfished. Worldwide, about 20% of the world fish catch comes from coral reefs, that less than 1% of the world ocean. The reefs around our islands protect us from coastal erosion. All, that, all those waves we see breaking offshore are losing their energy before they reach the beach, or if they reached the beach and broke on the beach, they would erode our coastlines away very rapidly. It's a wonderful underwater shot showing a wave breaking. You can see the coast through the face of the wave. And of course, those waves breaking on reefs create wonderful recreation here in Hawaii in terms of surfing. We have some of the best surf on the planet. Of course, all these wonderful gifts bring in tourists. And in fact, it's been estimated, or it was estimated, that around 2019, before the pandemic, coral reefs directly and indirectly brought in about $395 million per year to Hawaii. No, that's not right. $395 million per year in coastal protect protection and about $1.2 billion per year in tourism and related income. But here's a, here's a benefit of our reefs and our ocean that very few people think about, and that is coral reef organisms are providing new, me new medicines for us that are found nowhere else on the planet and are active against such horrible diseases as cancer. And who hasn't been touched by cancer directly or indirectly? And the organisms providing these wonder drugs to us are very humble creatures indeed. So over here on the left is a simple sponge that produces a strange chemical. These chemicals can only be pronounced by pharmacologists um, that treats breast cancer. In the center from a lowly sea squirt comes a treatment for leukemia, cancer of the blood. And on the right from a sea squirt, a chemical that treats ovarian cancer. This is an amazing treasure trove for the world, our coral reefs and the drugs they can provide for us. Most of these are still being explored and haven't been released by the FDA, but they're very actively being investigated by pharmaceutical companies. So wonderful blessings Mother Nature has given us here in Hawaii. But now we got to go to the dark side a bit. And I'm not doing this to depress everybody. In fact, we're going to end on a very hopeful note with the solutions. But our ocean is under great threat. And I would be remiss not to drag you through hell a little bit of the things that we in the ocean sciences are starting to see and many citizens are starting to experiment. So. Please bear with me, don't get depressed. It's not too late, we can solve these issues, but it's important to be aware of them. So the ultimate issue, of course, is the number of people on this planet, 2.8 billion and counting. And, you know, we get 
lots and lots of people visiting Hawaii every year, 10, billion, 10 million or so, way more than the 1.5 million that live here. We're being loved to death. And if we look at all the water on this planet, it would make a drop illustrated here, only 800 miles in diameter. So can going on 8 billion of us affect that much water? Absolutely. The ocean is a very, very thin layer over the surface of the earth. So what have we done here in Hawaii? Well, number one is we've had very poor land use historically. The ocean is downstream from everything. And we've traditionally treated the ocean as something that can just absorb anything we throw into it. And in fact, it can't. We damage our ocean with sediment that smothers the corals, any kind of coastal development, any kind of farming, any kind of building along the coast ends up producing sediment that flows out over our reefs, as you can see here after a rainstorm. Fertilizer and sewage from our agriculture and from our own waste stimulates the growth of seaweeds on our reefs, which then smother our corals. And of course, there's a whole variety of pollutants, various chemicals that we release into the ocean that stresses and kills sea life. We have to be more careful than we have been about what we allow to flow into our oceans. Now, one of the most insidious things that gaining a lot of press right now are plastics. In the 1950s, we started producing plastics at an industrial scale and actually started advertising plastics as things we can throw away after single use. They're so handy. And the problem is we're throwing away far too much plastic that ends up in our oceans. Every year, each foot of coastline on this planet, each one foot of coastline gets about five pounds of plastic. There's plastic everywhere. When it's large, it can ensnare animals. Much of that plastic is derelict fishing gear. You've seen the new film, Seaspiracy. Um, and it's obviously an eyesore. But it gets even worse as that plastic breaks down. Plastic does not go away. It simply breaks down from solar radiation, ultraviolet rays that break down the plastic into smaller and smaller pieces. And the smaller the pieces become, the more sea life eat that plastic. And one of the great travesties is the plastic that gets into baby seabirds. This is a dead Laysan albatross from um, Midway Atoll. And on the right are all the pieces of plastic that were found in this poor bird's gut. This plastic was fed to the chick by its parent, the parent believing that the plastic was a piece of food, filling up the chick's gut with plastic and the chick subsequently starving. Lots of plastic is being eaten by virtually all sea life out there. And it gets worse the smaller the plastic becomes. This is a photograph from a study done off the Big Island of Hawaii by two of my former UH colleagues, Jamie Gove and John Whitney, and their associates. And it shows a, um, a post larval file fish, which is only a couple inches long. It's actually fairly large for her larva. And just some of the plastic that was skimmed off the surface off the Big Island. The plastic is everywhere. And the microplastics, as they're called, as they get smaller, are now being found in our seafood and, importantly, in human feces. That is, those plastics are getting into us. And the small particles of plastic are known to adhere to ocean pollutants, becoming little poison pills. We've got to stop dumping so much plastic in the ocean. Now, many people will call attention to the fact that most of the plastic in our ocean comes from Southeast Asia, flowing out of rivers there. And in fact, a huge amount of the plastic does. But don't believe for a second 
that Hawaii does not contribute to the problem. All you have to do is go to places like Alawai Canal. That's our plastic junk floating in the water there. We can do a much better job than we have in keeping plastics out of our ocean. Okay, on to the next horrible problem. This is overfishing. Now, fishing is part of Hawaiian culture. Most of the population of Hawaii loves seafood, and many people like to fish. The problem is there's so many of us now that we are strongly depleting our reefs. This was brought to light by a variety of researchers. This particular graph, and sorry, I had to show one graph on the scientists, was um, done by Alan Friedlander, um, who lives here on Oahu, now works for the National Geographic Society, but is associated with UH. And if you look at the, what each one of these bars represent is sort of the weight of fish that's found in every sort of square meter of the reef. And the far left one you see here is the unfished part of Hawaii, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, Papahanao, Mokuakea. And the main Hawaiian islands are the green bars, the gray bars, and the orange bars you see on the right. If you look closely, you can read specific locations with color coding on the map here. And what I want you to notice is that dashed line that goes across the graph. That's 20% of the potential biomass of the reefs based on what we see in the unfished part of Hawaii. And most of the main islands are below that 20% threshold. Below 20% by most people is considered overfished. But if you look at the orange bars, they're way less than that. And we're talking really about most of Oahu and much of Maui where fishing has reduced populations to below 5% of their potential biomass. This is severe overfishing. So badly that it's inhibiting the ability of these populations to replenish. We have to address the overfishing issue on these islands. This is not just pollution that's causing these declines in coastal development. It's all just, so just too many people taking too many fish out of the water. Okay, marching on in our trudge through hell, we're facing invasive species. Now, many of you may have heard of the um, seaweeds that are getting out of control in Kaneohe Bay that fortunately were killed off by a warm water event. Even up at Papahanao Mokuakea, our preserved Northwest Islands, we're having problems. On Pearl and Hermes Reef, which used to look like this, the last scientific cruise that went up there in fall of 2019 found this very same reef completely smothered by an alga or a seaweed that was new to science and was subsequently described, in fact, by Allison Sherwood, who introduced me. Um, mystery where this thing came from, whether it was always there and just rare, but in any case, it has now overtaken this reef and smothered it. Hopefully, it's declined since it was first found. But we have problems like this throughout the world's ocean. Species that are not where they're supposed to be um, sometimes naturally dispersed, but very often dispersed by human activities, especially larvae being transported in the ballast tanks of large ships. But there are twin 200-pound gorillas in the room that ultimately may cause worse problems than we've seen so far. And this is the, the twins of ocean warming and ocean acidification. And I want to spend a little bit of time showing how all of us are contributing to this. This balloon, the pink balloon you see here that covers part of Europe, is all the air in the atmosphere brought into a single sphere. Although the atmosphere is thicker than the, the ocean, it's only about 10 miles thick. So again, we can affect 
what's in the atmosphere and in turn what's in our oceans. So let's look at how much carbon we put in the oceans or in the atmosphere and the oceans every year. So carbon dioxide comes from burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, as well as burning forests, which is happening rapidly in much of the world's tropics. And recently, before the pandemic, just before the pandemic, we dumped about 33 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So to make that tangible, that's the mass of about 100,000 Empire State Buildings, which laid to end to end would go all the way around the equator of the Earth, and then additionally, the width of the United States. And that's how much is thrown into the atmosphere every year by our activities. So which, what becomes of all that carbon? So this is extra carbon released from these fossil fuels and from burning forests. So about a quarter to a third is directly absorbed by the oceans, that it mixes with seawater. Another quarter to a third is taken up by living plants, growing plants. Thank goodness for the growing trees and natural vegetation on this planet. The rest goes into the atmosphere where it will reside for a very long time. That in the atmosphere enhances the greenhouse effect leading to a warming of the atmosphere, which in turn warms the oceans. About a 90% of that extra heat is absorbed directly by the oceans, leading to ocean warming. And the amount that's directly absorbed by the oceans leads to what's called ocean acidification. And I'll describe that a little bit later. So these are the evil twins of human activities over the last 150 years, ocean warming and ocean acidification. Let's look at the problems they're causing us. Well, the ocean is definitely getting warmer. This is a temperature record from Hawaii. And what we can see is if we start cutting down on our carbon emissions, we can reduce the amount of warming in the future, showing there in the green blobs. These are all projections by models into the future with the little squiggly line being the actual record. And the red blob is if we keep going, how much warmer it will get. And you can see it's not just linear, it's actually increasing exponentially. Hopefully we'll get our acts together soon and stop dumping so much into the atmosphere. So what that warming of the ocean does first is it causes seawater to expand as well as made melting the ice that occurs on land, the glaciers of the ocean. And this is causing sea levels to rise. We already know sea level is rising. There's no question about it, but it's rising at an accelerating pace. These are projections made by Chip Fletcher here at UH Manoa into the future, showing the coast of Waikiki. And you can see there's a lot of land being taken by ocean by the time we get to the end of this century. If we zoom in, we can see a lot of really weird things that are going to be happening. That is, Magic Island will in fact be an island by the end of the century. Alawai Boat Harbor will be gone. You won't be able to golf an Alawai golf course anymore. And even worse, most of the streets of Waikiki and the buildings will be flooded. This is absolutely going to happen. There's no way to stop this at this point. Yet we continue to build right up to the water's edge on these low-lying lands of Oahu and our other islands. Now, unfortunately, it's not going to be like Waikiki suddenly becomes this wonderful Venice of the Pacific. In fact, these encroaching waters are going to release a huge amount of pollution onto our our surrounding coastal waters, and whatever corals there now will almost certainly be killed, and it's going to be a, a very severe dead zone along our southern coast of this island and elsewhere. We've got to start planning ahead for this and start retreating from the ocean, not trying to pretend this isn't happening. 
Storms are already worsening. There's already a good record of that. We saw the horrific hurricane season that occurred in the Atlantic last summer. Fortunately, the Atlantic and the Pacific hurricane seasons tend to oscillate. When one is bad, the other isn't so bad. We were lucky last year, and in fact, we will be lucky this summer. We're projecting a fairly low hurricane season in the Pacific, but that's not going to last forever. Now, what hurricanes do when they come in into shallow water is they can devastate our local reefs. Back in 2018, Hurricane Wallaka followed a path similar to Aniki, which curled around Hawaii and snuck up and hit Kauai. Wallaka hit the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and went right over what's called French Frigate Shoals, one of the reefs there. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, French Frigate Shoals used to be home to the most beautiful coral reef in Hawaii called Rapture Reef by the scientists. And that hurricane, Category 5 hurricane, literally erased that reef off the face of the earth, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner. Shallow reefs cannot take storms of that magnitude. It will be many years for this reef to recover. And of course, when these storms hit the coast, they cause severe erosion, not to mention tremendous damage and loss of human life. As the oceans warm, our corals are starting to bleach. Coral bleaching was unknown in Hawaii till the 1990s, and in recent years, it's been recurring. So what is this coral bleaching? The corals are actually animals that live in association with microbes that feed them. These microbes live in the tissue of the corals and give the corals their color, as you can see on the left. What happens when the water becomes too warm is this wonderful mutualism breaks down and the corals have no choice but to expel those microbes into the water. And that's how the corals lose their color, appear to be white, and we call them bleached. They're not really bleached, they've just lost their color. And if the water stays warm, the coral then dies, is overgrown by seaweeds, and eventually collapses into rubble. And that beautiful, system that we call the coral reef dies. So this is starting to happen in reefs in Hawaii. It's already happened in many areas elsewhere around the world. And I personally have witnessed this. I lost my favorite coral reef in the Bahamas back in 1997 during the first global coral bleaching event. Hawaii has been pretty lucky so far. We've had bleaching events, but not major death of reefs. But just to predict what's going to be happening more frequently in the future, you see healthy corals are kind of a greenish tinge typically, which reflects those little plant-like microbes that live inside of them. When a reef bleaches, as Molokini did off Maui in uh, 2015, the corals turn pure white. If the water gets cool enough again and there's enough of those zooxanthellae around, those corals will recover. If it stays warm, the corals starve to death and die. And what a deep dead reef looks like is this, just coral rubble, none of that wonderful life that we're used to. This brought tears to my eyes when I witnessed this happen to my favorite reef. And there are already plenty of reefs that have already died from our poor land use practices in Hawaii. I hope we'll be safe in the future. Time will tell. And then the other evil twin is ocean acidification. And then I'll get to the end of this trudge through hell. So there's a lot of um, misinformation out there about ocean acidification. So I want to kind of lead you through it. If you're a chemist or no chemistry, you can look at the diagrams. I'm not going to spend time talking about the chemistry per se, except that when all that carbon dioxide mixes with seawater, it mixes with water literally, reacts with water and forms a weak acid, carbonic acid, same acid that's in your soda pop. I know, don't know about you, but when I was young, my mom said, don't drink so much Coke, it will dissolve your teeth. And in fact, that's right. Acid dissolves 
stuff that's made out of calcium. So what happens is that calcium carbonate doesn't really make the ocean acid per se. It makes it less basic if you know chemistry. What it does do is react with carbonate that's in the dissolved in the ocean. And the carbonate is what forms the calcium carbonate skeletons of much of our sea life. So this increasing acidification of the ocean is really just robbing sea life of their skeletons, making it more difficult for that sea life to grow. And in extreme cases, actually dissolving their skeletons. And this includes corals, sea urchins, clams and their relatives, sea stars, and a whole variety of sea life, including the inner ear stones of juvenile fishes. Fishes don't have skeletons made out of calcium carbonate. They're like us. They have calcium phosphate skeletons, but their little ear stones that help them hear and have balance are made out of calcium carbonate. And acidic waters um, affect those larval fish as they grow. So these are projections into the future. The ocean chemists say this is very simple chemistry. They have very high confidence that this is what the future will look like. The little circles represent um, Hawaii. Um, in the present, where we're not having any problems with this ocean, um, ocean acidification yet, it'll start getting stressful mid-century and even more stressful by the end of the century, when it will be more difficult for our sea life to grow because of ocean acidification. So, sorry about that, folks, but I had to let you know what's going on. And unfortunately, all these bad things are accelerating exponentially, so we really ain't seen nothing yet. So, bummer, and I'm sorry, but there are solutions. And I wanna spend some time looking at these solutions because we can all make a difference by not only what we do as individuals, but by telling our politicians and our policymakers to do the right thing. So let's come out of the dark, back into the light, and take on these issues for our children and grandchildren. Papa Hanau Moku, Mother Earth, has given us so many wonderful things, as I've already reviewed. But we often don't appreciate exactly how amazing these gifts are. Let me give you one example. This is the story of the uhu, or the parrotfish. Uhu are major consumers of seaweeds on our reefs. They scrape dead reef surfaces and keep them clean so that corals can grow. The Uhu are gifts to us. And in addition to cleaning the reefs, they poop sand, a lot of sand. One large Uhu poops almost half a ton of sand a year. So they're producing more sand for our beaches, which means less erosion. And unfortunately, uhu are exceptionally popular as food fish. So they are severely overfished on our islands, which means we're sort of sitting ducks for when corals die. More seaweed covering the reef, less coral. And less sand, and therefore more coastal erosion. These fish should be swarming on our reefs. And they're now very uncommon. Every fisherman knows that. Yet we continue to take smaller and smaller uhu. There's even guys who go out at night on scuba and kill the fish while they're sleeping under ledges. We have to save the uhu if we want to save our reefs. And not do things like this, which is called bombing a reef. You go down on scuba, you wipe out all the fish. Most of the fish in this photograph are parrotfish from one reef wiped out at night in a single blow. We have to stop doing this kind of stuff. So I have a vision, and many people have a vision for Hawaii, and that is Hawaii as a sustainability showcase for the world. Many people are working on this already, and we have to encourage this, all of us. We have to encourage our leaders to be courageous to do the right things for the future, for the keiki 
And we have to be engaged citizens so that we're doing the right thing and we're encouraging our leaders to lead the way. And we're already taking steps in this direction. There's more we can do, but we're already on our way to being a showcase for the world. And with all those 10 million visitors that come every year, we can teach them and that can spread to the rest of the earth. We have an Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency here in Honolulu. We need to support them and their good work. We have NGOs, non-governmental organizations, doing great work, the Nature Conservancy, the Sierra Club. We have to encourage them and support them. Governor Ige has supported the Sustainable Hawaii Initiative. Most of it is not a law yet. Part of it is, but not most of it. So let's look briefly at this. Plastics are starting to be addressed here. Honolulu passed Bill um, 30, which is supposed to get rid of single-use plastics. It's only been partially implemented. We need more work on that. There's an effort now to, to increase local agricultural production by 2020 by 100%. We haven't quite made it. We need to add to this fish ponds. There's efforts now to to rebuild Hawaii's fish ponds, which are wonderful natural aquaculture facilities. Interagency biosecurity plan to control invasive species, a good thing. And then these two 30 by 30 plans to um, protect 30% of our watersheds by 3030. Um, that needs to include reforestation and recovery of our native vegetation, which will prevent all that sediment from running off into the ocean. 30% of our ocean is to be protected one way or another by 3030. And then the 100% renewable energy by 2040, that has been passed to law, which is wonderful. I just wish that we do more than 30% of our watersheds and our oceans. And that we come to 100% renewable energy in less than 25 years. But let's focus for a minute um, on our marine management plans. The Division of Aquatic Resources has been tasked with protecting, increasing protection of about 30% of our coastline by 3030. And they're running into very stiff resistance, mostly from the fishing community, who are afraid that fishing areas are going to be closed and nothing will be there to replace them. So many ocean scientists are now doing research showing that in fact, protected areas in the ocean are actually benefiting fisheries and benefiting our oceans, not just taking away. And more people need to be aware of that. So this is where I wanna give an example of some research that my colleagues and I have done on this issue. Now a reserve can actually not only build up the abundance of fish inside the reserves where fishing are not allowed, but also benefit fisheries outside in two ways. One is the fish inside the reserve spawn and they seed areas outside with larvae, their offspring. This used to be a theory, we've now demonstrated it. And there's also now plenty of work showing that fish that settle and grow inside reserves protected, many of them will spill out or spill over onto the surrounding fish areas and replenish fishing. This has been found in Hawaii already. Now, one example that a group of us are doing is called fish flow. And I wanna give you an example of that on the Big Island. This is actually tracing where our fish go from the time they're spawned all the way to the dinner table. Now, as scientists, we can now track larval dispersal, that is where the parents spawn and where their larvae end up settling and growing. This is from population geneticists. The best example here in Hawaii is the Tobo Lab, Rob Tonin and Brian Bowen, who are doing much of this research. This is some work my lab did showing the distribution or the dispersal of yellow tang on the Big Island. If we take that as a typical species on the Big Island, what it shows us 
is that most of the larvae come from the southern part of the island and settle on the northern part of the island. Now, in an independent study of food fish, Jack Kittinger, who lives here and works for Conservation International, documented the catch that was landed at Kiholo and where it was distributed in the island, as far as away as Hilo. And when you combine these data sets, what they tell us is that the people who eat fish in Hilo should be concerned about the health of reefs at the southern end of the Big Island, because that's where many of their fish come from. So fish flow shows people how connected they are with the ocean and with each other as fish flow from where they're spawned to where they grow up to where they're captured to where they're distributed and eventually eaten. Something similar is here on the Big Island, or on Oahu, I mean. Um, on the left is a recent study by Richard Coleman, who was a grad student of Brian Bowen, showing where manini are spawned and settle. You can see that he sampled all the way around Oahu, but most of the action was on the windward coast. And it shows that Kaneohe Bay is, is replenished both from reefs to the north and reefs to the south. The red squares or red rectangles show where parents and offspring were actually found in the same location. All you need are little fin clips from the fish to follow their genetics. It's just like parentage analysis or um, paternity analysis in humans. And then in another independent study, Ed Glazier showed the fish that were landed in Haleiwa and how they were distributed through the island as far as Kaneohe. Again, fish flow can teach us much about our dependence on fishery resources, and why we should be concerned about our local reefs. So to finish up, we're at a crossroads with our ocean, and we have the choice of what to do. It's, all, it's up to all of us to make this decision. We can stick with the status quo, which is not working. The status quo is bringing us poor land use that smothers our coastal ecosystems, lots of plastic debris, and all the insidious nature of microplastics, overfishing, no question we've, we've got too much fishing going on, invasive species, and then we're warming ocean, bringing a sea level rise and worsening storms, coral bleaching, and death, and ocean acidification. Not a pretty picture for our keiki, but we can change, and we're starting to change. The Hawaii so Showcase will bring cleaner watersheds and cleaner coastal ecosystems. We'll get rid of single-use plastics and stop throwing them in our ocean. Marine reserves will replenish our fisheries as well as protect some of our best reefs. We'll have biosecurity to keep invasive species out and detect them early. Renewable energy will start to address global warming. Reforestation will absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and um, clean up our watersheds. And then local agriculture will have a huge effect on our carbon footprint, along with aquaculture replenishing our fish ponds. Many people are working on all these things already, but we need to keep pushing our policymakers and ourselves to do more. So the ancient Hawaiians had it right. They knew long ago that if we care for the ocean, the ocean will care for us. I hope you will take all this to mind. Thank you so much for paying attention. And for the kids, mahalo. Thank you. Happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hickson, for sharing your inspiring message with us today. That was really a wonderful talk. Thank you again. We have a few questions that have come in in the chat. So I think what we'll do is start with those. We'll try to cover as many of those as we can. Um, but for those of you who would also like to ask your questions directly, you can feel free to use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand and ask a question. So the first question in the chat is from Hiroshi Kato. And 
They ask, is there an overpopulation of Honu? <laughs> You'd have to define what an overpopulation is. Certainly, the abundance of Honu are not yet to levels that they were before humans came along. There's no question about that. In fact, all Honu are still protected under the Endangered Species Act. The reason they were able to come back is that they found nesting beaches where people stopped eating the eggs and people stopped eating the Honu. But I would not say that Honu are overpopulated by any means. Okay, our second question from Jean Herbert. Since land runoff significantly impacts coral reefs, why isn't Hawaii doing more to address the Malka to Makai issue of runoff? Well, I guess the short answer is probably money. Coastal development is extremely profitable here in Hawaii. And for those of us who are aware of sea level rise, it just seems absurd to see giant buildings going in at Kaka'ako and other places that are going to be underwater within a matter of decades. But talking to people about this, the developers make their money, the builders make their money, the first owners make their money. They're not that concerned about what's going to be happening decades down the road. The solution is that we need to start thinking about the future not just the present and making money now. That's me speaking as a fellow citizen. Thanks, Mark. So the next question that came in the chat was, will the use of sea species for new pharmaceuticals end up endangering those species? That's an excellent question. And it turns out that much of the time, once these new compounds are discovered, and found to have medicinal properties, the chemists find ways to synthesize them artificially rather than having to harvest the original animal or organism. And that's, that's typically been the case. In rare circumstances, they do have to continue to harvest the organism. And um, we should keep our reefs alive in case it's a drug that saves your life someday. Okay, next question. Um, over a period of millennia, the world may be very different and more difficult for humans and other current species, but isn't it likely other species will evolve that will thrive in this new world? Scientists seem to work so hard to maintain the status quo. Yes, that's a very good question. I personally am not worried about the fate of the earth. The earth is going to do just fine in the long run. My concern is the quality of life of my children and grandchildren and of future generations. The earth's going to go on fine regardless of what we do to it, but we can make life very miserable for ourselves if we continue to do many of the things we're already doing. In terms of status quo, the world we live in now has been a sweet spot in the history of the earth. There's been times when the earth was not particularly inhabitable by people. But we evolved over the last million years or so during a very pleasant time on Earth's surface. We can hasten the, the end of that time, or we can seek to ease the burden of transition as the Earth continues to evolve and change. This change is always inevitable. Thank you, Mark. Um, so, Alexander Fair, you have a hand raised. You're welcome to unmute and ask your question, and then we'll go back to the chat questions. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have been passionate about the ocean and its health and uh, kind of everything you've brought up for a long time, but I don't know how to, you know, I want to seek it professionally, but it seems so many of the opportunities are um, to change my lifestyle and, and live on a boat and become a scientist. And that's not how I want to live. So I was wondering, how can I be a modern man in this world and also protect our oceans and, you know, live the life that I live now, but also 
live my dream? That's a fair question. Thanks for asking it. The issue is really that the United States per capita consumes far more resources than most of the rest of the world. We have developed a standard of living that has enabled about 4% of the Earth's population to consume about a quarter of the Earth's resources. It's not sustainable what we do. But the changes that are required don't have to put us back in the Stone Age by any means. They are just relatively straightforward choices. A few examples. If we consume less meat and eat lower on the food web, that is, we go mostly vegetarian, we can be, have very healthy lives, in fact, more healthy lives, and have a huge reduction in our carbon footprint. If we drink water out of the tap, as opposed to um, drinking bottled water that's been shipped around the world with a huge carbon, huge carbon footprint, that's another big issue. These are not major changes. Yes, we can not waste electricity. We don't have to drive everywhere and fly everywhere. But we don't have to have a life that's uncomfortable. We just need to ease back on the level of consumption. That's my opinion as a fellow citizen. Thanks for asking. Okay, heading back to the chat, there's a question from Christy Martin. So regarding the synergistic effects of climate change and invasive species or the research into those effects for islands, do we know what we should do to make the necessary policy and management decisions to protect reefs and other natural resources? Thanks for that question, Christy. Christy happens to really know this stuff. Um, yeah, the problem with, with ocean warming is that it's, it's redistributing species around the globe. At the same time, humans are spreading larvae of a variety of species all around the globe. As far as I know about biosecurity, most of my expertise comes from studying the lionfish invasion in the Caribbean. But the key issue is always prevention first as much as possible, keeping the larvae out of that ballast water, making sure ballast water is not dumped in our harbors, for example, but mostly dumped out at sea where it drifts away. Prevention first. Secondly, early detection. If we have enough eyes and sensors in the water, we can detect these things before they spread very rapidly and hopefully take remedial action. Those are the first two crucial steps. Once something gets completely out of control, it takes way too many man hours, human hours, way too much money to try to cause eradication, which is usually impossible. We've been lucky, for example, that the fishes that have been introduced in Hawaii have not caused major problems so far. And the seaweed outbreaks that we had in Kaneohe Bay were killed off by a warm water event. They happen to be more susceptible to warm water rather than augmented by it. But the bottom line always is going to be early detection and early eradication. Okay, so next question from the chat. Do you have a short list for the average consumer to raise awareness and influence behaviors? Do you think we will recover from plastic pollution? There's many of the um, environmental organizations have wonderful, you know, 10 tips for saving the ocean lists. And I would encourage anyone just to go online and, at, and just do a search for, you know, tips to save the ocean. There's many different ones and they're all fairly straightforward. I mean, you know, you use as little plastic as possible. Um, use, buy clothing that's made out of natural materials as opposed to, you know, polyester, huge amount of microplastics just exude off our clothing is made out of polyester. Um, eat lower on the food web, as I mentioned earlier. Um, of course, if you can afford it, you know, go with solar panels and electric cars, you know, be a good citizen as far as your carbon footprint. You know, a whole variety of things like that. Um, consume species of seafood that come from reasonably sustainable fisheries. 
Species like mahi-mahi produce very, very rapidly in the ocean. They're very good at reproducing and can withstand much heavier fishing pressure than many of our reef fishes, such as the uhu, things like that. Be, be an informed consumer and tread lightly. Thank you, Mark. So Alexandra, um, your hand is raised and you're welcome to ask your question. Just really quickly, I, I really appreciate that as, as a consumer, I, I take on a lot of those things already, the answer you gave already, but from a changing my professional lifestyle, is there a, a space in oceanography or marine biology that you believe needs more attention and needs more people directly focused in? I, it, every problem I mentioned, every, could problem. Use, yeah. every problem I mentioned could use more experts on it. Um, Perfect. Maybe, maybe specifically for you, you know, you might want to go to the UH webpage and look at the uh, faculty who are studying the ocean and what their expertise is and, and see where the holes are. There are gaps. Perfect. Well, mahalo. And thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Mahalo. Okay, so coming back to the chat, Mark, there's a question. How do turtles find shell cleaning fish? <laughs> they just, um, usually if, they, if they're just cruising over a reef, the fish find them. So the, the, um, the photo I showed with the surgeon fish, surgeon fish are, are grazers that feed, feed off um, low levels of algae all the time. And many of our honu, I think the fish probably learn it because many of our honu will sit on the seafloor on reefs and just take a break during the day. And at that time, they're just part of the reef surface and the fish come up and just graze off their shells. And eventually the fish just know if there's a honu, there's some free food. And the honu themselves will learn if they have lots and lots of algae on them, they just sort of hold still while the fish are, are grazing off of them. Maybe it, maybe it feels good. Okay, lastly, there's a question from Francis about whether there will be a recording of this talk available. Um, and so this is our inaugural presentation in our webinar series. We are recording the talk. Um, we have yet to determine exactly how these recordings might be made available, but we will reach out to all of you when we have that information. So thank you so much for asking about that. We hope we can make that available. So just to finish off, we'd like to thank you all for attending our inaugural webinar for the College of Natural Sciences. We'd like to extend a very special thank you to Professor Puake and Nogelmeyer. He came up with our name for our series, so Pilina Ao or Living Links. I'd like to say a very warm, hearty thank you to Dr. Mark Hickson for his fabulous presentation thank today. Thank you, Mark, that was really fabulous. We look forward to seeing all of you on June 23rd for our second webinar. It'll be held at the same time and you'll be receiving an invitation soon from us to that presentation. So if you have any comments or questions about the presentation today or about the College of Natural Sciences at UH, please reach out to us. We look forward to hearing from you. Mahalo and aloha until we meet again. <laughs>